Welcome to O-State Daily. Casey Porter here, joined by Chase Witwiska. As we do each and every week, we break down Oklahoma State and their big victory against Houston this past weekend. OSU now is one win away. The Big 12 came out and clarified it. So when one win away, whether it be OU or Texas or whoever it may be, OSU just needs to take care of their own business, and they will be in the Big 12 championship game in Arlington, Chase. Yeah, man, I'm really excited. You know, at the beginning of the season, I'm not sure how many people thought we'd end up there. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, th- this this last week showed Oklahoma State's true colors in terms of, you know, what I've been talking about, where there's there's not a lot of quit. There's not a lot of give up. There's not a lot of um, just rolling over and, and saying, you know, the odds are against us. Let's just give up. Um, you know, they, they played really a really bad first half and a really good second half. Yep, no doubt about it in that first half. Actually, you know, I mean, the game kind of started okay. I mean, OSU was – I didn't feel uncomfortable at all until, you know, Bowen threw the pick. I still didn't feel uncomfortable then. I didn't feel uncomfortable at all until Houston had the ball. I can't remember the exact score. I mean, they were – whenever they threw the interception, that possession Mm -hmm. right there, that was the first time I really felt like, hey, I think it was 21-9 to at that point. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, guys, I'm not sure 28-9 – to we have the type of offense because then you're in a throw-a-thon. We saw how that goes. That was really the only time I got worried, and it was kind of short-lived. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. I, I was a little bit frustrated. Um, one, you know, once again in that in that first half, it was just it, it was just frustrating football to watch. Um, you know, and I I think that it almost it almost looked like, you know, we beat Oklahoma and and these next it. The, la- the next six quarters don't matter, you know. Like I said, they, they come out and they play a, a whole bunch better in the second half. But it looked like they, they still had a little bit of a hangover from Central Florida and from OU in that in that first part of that game. The 10 points right before half were the saviors, weren't they? They were, absolutely. Looking at the fact that, that of course, you went down to the halftime, down just four so you got the ten points. You were down fourteen, and you're—I mean, you were looking. At, and Houston, man, if they go score there, that—that that was going to be tough. But having said that, Alan Bowman—he did throw the pick six. His quarterback rating was a little bit over seventy. Although he did throw the pick six, I broke that down in the highlight show. The rest of the day for him was pretty darn good. Two two touchdowns. I know he went. Alan Bowman went uh, twenty-nine for forty-three on the afternoon. He averaged eight yards. Per throw, and one thing that they did with him that they always do, they had him throw that sideline route from the far hash time after time after time, and he did it on three or four really big third downs to Brennan Presley. Yeah, and I mean, let's talk about Brennan Presley. What I mean, a heck of a game, man. He had 15 receptions. I mean, he was just shy of 200 yards. Um, He didn't have any touchdowns. He had a heck of a game. You know, that's that's really impressive. And and you know, Ollie. Ollie came back this week and, and looked a little bit more healthy. Um, he looked um, he looked like the old Ollie, um, you know. He, and I think that was that was why you saw a lot of success from Bowman um, and a lot of success from Ollie's. You know, both of them were able to be weapons. Um, Houston wasn't able to just sit back on the pass, and they weren't able to just stack the box. Um, Oklahoma State figured out a way to hurt them in both ways, um, and that's really hard to call a defense against. So one thing that you mention every week, Chase, you love the motions. And the reason Mm -hmm. is, hey, when you have a guy like Alan Bowman who's a transfer in, you have a guy like Josiah Johnson, a transfer in. Then you have freshmen that you're working in, especially on the defensive side of the ball. What's happened is these coaches, you can't have these big elaborate schemes like you used to have, you know, where you'd redshirt entire classes and then a a kid wouldn't play until he's in your system for like the third year. So you could have these elaborate schemes that kids could learn over the years. Nowadays, you have, your scheme has to be fairly simple because guys have to show up, and literally about a month later, they have to know it. Not only do they have to know it, they have to execute it. So mm-hmm. what coaches have to do now is that the plays and the concepts that they have have to be minimalized, hey, not very many. You know, like OSU runs the mesh routes. They run, they run the counter. They run a little bit of zone. They run the stick routes, the hitches, and that kind of thing. That's pretty much it, right, the slants, okay? So you have a, a, a minimal amount of concepts because other than that, you're not going to be able to mesh all these new guys together, right? So if you're going to do that, 
then you have to present it in a whole bunch of different ways. So I thought Casey Dunn did a great job using formation, using motion to, you know, keep it, although the, you know, the, the concepts were simple, to keep that structure complicated enough to where Houston couldn't get a beat on it. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and he, he, did, he did against Houston what he's done every other week except for Central Florida um, outside of those first three games. You know, it, it was um, – there was a lot more motion. There was a lot more – there's different looks. There's all kinds of stuff. And there's like you said, they're still running the same things. It's just out of different looks. Um, and, and when you add all those different looks, it makes it, makes it really hard for the defensive coordinator – and it makes it hard for the defense because they're like, you know, we we only have six days to prepare for all of these different looks. And you may see all of them. You may see five. Who knows? Um, but when you're able to execute at a high level with the with just the simplicity of the offense in different formations and different looks, it makes it really hard for a defense. And it makes it really hard for a defensive coordinator to really stop you and figure out how to uh, – keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So the best coaches, you know, hey, it's like a pitcher in baseball because everything can be related to baseball, right? <laughs> hey, I have a fastball, right? So how am I going to set my fastball up? You're going to have to beat my fastball. Like, oh, she runs the counter. So instead of saying, hey, well, the defense does this, so it's going to make it hard to run our counter this week, figure out what you have to do from a formation perspective to get the defense tilted to actually run your counter. Yeah. I thought Casey Dunn was a master at that this weekend. Yeah, I mean, he, um, like I said, he, I think he's done a, a, a great job overall this season, especially if you compare him to the past few seasons where it just hasn't been very good. Um, I'm yeah. just, let's just be honest. Um, the offense the past few years has, has stunk. Uh, the offensive scheme has not been good. Uh, and luckily you've had athletes like Spencer Sanders and Jalen Warren and guys like that to, to kind of make you right um, and, and make it not look as bad. Um, but this year, I think he's really stepped up his game. You know, him and and, uh, and Coach Gundy and and all the offensive minds, for that matter, really, you know, just coming together just in that bye week and just saying, listen, we've got to stick to these these few things that, and we're going to be successful. And, I mean, they've done that, and it, it's, it's proven to be true. Yeah. We're going to do these couple things. Let's figure it out from a schematical perspective how we can run these things successfully. Every week, instead of just changing every week, you know, mm -hmm. and just throwing away, trying to go to a whole new set of plays and that kind of deal. Okay, the offensive line, man, our offensive line, no sacks again. Preston Wilson, he was just absolutely awesome. I mean, they asked him to do a whole bunch of stuff. You know, he, he, they asked him to be a Mack truck in a lot of the goal line game. They asked him to pull quite a bit. Cole Birmingham was simply fantastic as well. Joe Mahalski, he's always really good. Jake Springfield had a great game. And then the H-backs, they were just – our H the H-backs at Oklahoma State, if there is a better blocking group of H-backs in the United States of America, I can't say this definitively because I really don't watch other teams play very much. And to be honest with you, when I do watch other teams play, I don't notice their H-backs blocking like Oklahoma State's do. Hey, man, when you talk about Braden Cassidy – and Josiah Johnson and and all of the rest, Jake Schultz and, and Drummond and all the guys that come in at H-back. I'm not sure there's a better group of H-backs that block in the United States of America. And so one thing I think happened is, and I think this needs to be permanent, okay, you know, Joe Wickline, he was a great offensive line coach, but they were constantly shifting guys, kind of making them interchangeable pieces, right, in the zones. And I think in a zone scheme you can because your rules stay the same. But I think it's really be, it's been a benefit to this year's offensive line, man. Just put them in one spot and leave them there, and let them mm -hmm. be comfortable in one spot. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I I think that uh, you know you mentioned the H backs, and um, you know, there's definitely there's not another offense in the Big Twelve that really runs those H backs like Oklahoma State does. Um, to me, it kind of reminds me of more of a Big Ten, more of a Big Ten look in terms of you know it's it's just going to be kind of a ground and pound you know that that's kind of what the big Ten's known for they're not known for really airing it out it's just big on big and you know let's get three four yards a pop and and maybe pull out a big one every now and then um but that's kind of what it reminds me of in terms of you know if you look at an, a, an overall conference or teams or things like that um you know and i watch a little bit of big 10 football i think it's a little bit more boring than the big 12 but um you know i, I like you said i don't really see a whole lot of 
HVACs blocking like that, you know, tight ends. And, um, you know, there, there's very few teams and that, that use the schemes and um, the looks that Oklahoma State does um, and that are able to find success with it with these HVACs. You know, it, they, they have played such a huge role this season. Um, and, and you don't – I don't. I still don't feel like they get enough credit um, mm, they you, don't. Maybe, maybe from us, um, just because we see it in a different perspective. But you know, it's uh, one thing that I do like about you know Ollie Gordon and and uh, Bowman and, and guys like that is, is they give. I mean, their hats off to the O line. Hats, you know, H backs guys, guys that are helping them be successful. So all these guys that are grabbing the attention from a national perspective um, are, are kind of trying to shine a little bit of light on the guys that. I mean, they they, they work hard and they. Uh, they're in the trenches every play, and like I said, you, they don't get a lot of attention because they're not the guy making the, the scoring the touchdown. They're not the guy making the reception, things like that. But they are, without them, that those plays aren't going to happen. Mm-mm. Do you see Preston Wilson on the touchdown run from Ollie Gordon just just pancaking his guy about three yards into the end zone? I mean, he started driving him about the five or six. And just never stopped until the dude was on the ground in the end zone. I mean, it was awesome. It reminded me of the blind side, except he didn't go over the fence. (laughs) I mean, that was about it. Yeah. Yeah, and then did you see the one where Birmingham came around to the right side? And, I mean, he got the guy on roller skates, and he just absolutely demolished that dude. (laughs) That, that, I mean, that was a lot of fun to watch. Of course, you know, hey, I enjoy run game. I think you have to be – I think the run game is the most creative part uh, football because you're trying to figure out how to open holes. So I, I really enjoy watching the offensive line play. I enjoy watching the H backs, and I enjoy watching running backs get in a sync with that offensive line. It's it's really cool to watch. Yeah, because you, know, you notice. I mean, hey, Jaden Nixon's a good back, mm-hmm. but you can just tell he's not in sync with the offensive line, right? Right, and, and, and you can tell that with his carries. You know, I I mean, I uh, it, it is what it is. You know, he like I said, he's not a bad back. Um, it, it's just it's really hard when you're a backup to a guy like Ollie Gordon. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's hard to look successful and it's hard to look good when you're behind a guy like him. You know, he's big, he's fast, strong. Uh, he's putting up over 100 yards almost every week. Um, but talking about the O-line play, I, that's one of the reasons I really like watching the Philadelphia Eagles. Mm-hmm. That O-line is a lot of fun to watch. And I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, so it kills me to say that. But, man, I, I like to watch the Eagles play. I, I like to watch how their O-line just, you know, they just get after it. You know, they have – a lot of fun and, and Jalen Hurts and, and guys like that, um, you know, that are playing behind them. Like I said, they, they do what Bowman and Gordon do, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, without the old line, this stuff's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean, that's, that's one of the big reasons, like I said, I like watching Oklahoma state and I like, and I like watching the Eagles and I hate mm-hmm. the Eagles with all my heart, but they're fun to watch. I thought this was Casey Dunn's best week of formationing, motioning, and then, Setting up the run with the pass early on. You could tell Houston, I, you know, I've got it on, on my social medias where they were either lining up seven in the box, bringing down two safeties, or lining up six in the blocks, bringing down them. They were seven to eight guys playing run basically the entire first half. So I thought instead of just beating your head against the wall, like we've seen OSU do in the past, we're like, guys, there's stuff in the box. We can't run the ball, right? right. I thought instead of doing that, even with the pick six, I thought Casey Dunn did a fantastic job of setting up the run with the pass. Yeah, I, I think he called this game a lot like <laughs> Oklahoma um, mm-hmm. in, in terms of, of schematics and things like that. And and maybe not the exact same formations, but Oklahoma, they went into the game, you know, we're going to stop the run. And Bowman pops off for 350. The next thing you know, they're like, well, we can't just put seven, eight guys in the box. And now all he's breaking loose for 100, 150, whatever he mm-hmm. had. Um, you know, so that's, that's really what this game reminded me of in, in terms of how he called it. Um, and I, I, I truly think, um, looking back now, it, it was, it might be a good thing that central Florida did what they did to us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think not only was it a little bit of a rattle on the cage saying, Hey, you know, Hey, wake up. You, you still got two more regular season games left, um, to get to Arlington, but it's also like, you know, they, they, oh, UCF went into the game saying, you're not going to run the ball. You're mm-hmm. not. And, and Bowman just, he didn't have a great game. Um, weather conditions and stuff like that definitely weren't helpful. Um, and I think that there was a little bit of complacency in the offensive play calling. So they might, um, you know, I, I hope they got on the office on Sunday and said, you know, this is stuff that we've got to fix because they know that Houston's going to do the same thing. 
when you when you have a back like Ollie Gordon, that's who everybody's going to key on. So they're going to make you hurt him with Bowman. They're going to make you hurt him with Presley, uh, Rashad Owens, all those guys. And uh, Casey Dunn did a great job. Yep. So set up the run with the pass. And then I thought Casey Dunn, right when Oklahoma State took the lead there early in the second half, did a great job at that point of inserting Ollie Gordon and letting, you know, once you get the lead, you have the momentum, now feed the rock to Ollie. Take this game over with your running game. I thought he knew the exact time to kind of switch gears, if you will. Say, mm-hmm. okay, now we need to go back to our run game. We need to insert our dominance, and we need to take control of this game with Ollie Gordon. I thought he transitioned perfectly there in the third quarter. I thought he did as well, and I, I don't. I hope nobody went – and saw that, and it's like, oh, great, you know, now we're playing, you know, a little bit complacent and stuff like that. That's not, that's not the case. What they're doing is Houston's backs against the wall, mm-hmm. and what in their mind, they're like, we can't let any more big plays happen. So what are they going to do? The defense is going to back up. As soon as the defense backs up and you have a guy like Ollie Gordon, you know, it, it, it's game over. You know, that you're not going to stop him. You're not going to stop the offense. And, you know, if they, if they do figure out a way to stop Ollie somehow, some way, you got Brennan Presley going for almost 200, and you got mm-hmm. Rashad Owens, who's just an absolute dog. And then uh, Leon Johnson, man, he, he's become one of my favorite guys. Mm-hmm. Just just kind of comes out of nowhere um, several weeks into the season. Don't forget Jaden Bray on the first touchdown. Yeah, welcome back. You know, yeah. that was, And that was a great pass, by the way, too. I mean, that, Well, that it was a great route because he stayed at the numbers and gave enough space for Bowman to throw. You know, so many receivers hug that sideline, and the quarterback doesn't have any space to throw it to. Yeah, and, and speaking from experience, that's a hard ball to throw mm-hmm. because you you really have about seven to eight yards of miss. You know, yeah, right. You, if you throw it, if you throw it just a, a little too far to the outside, it's going out of bounds. You throw it too far inside, it's going to get picked. Um, so he, you know, he he threw a really, really, really good ball. Um, you know, and, and Bray did a great job of getting separation and, and putting himself in position to uh, not only allow Bowman to make the throw that he did. But he also put himself in a, in a good position to, to maybe carry one way or another, which he, he kind of carried towards the sideline on the catch. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a great job. And I, I was glad to see him back. You know, mm-hmm. his one catch was that one touchdown. And, and uh, I, I think you'll see him a little bit more this week. And then hopefully when, you, when they get to Arlington, knock on wood, hopefully you see him a little bit more then and then in the bowl game. Uh, but, man, I'm looking forward to seeing these guys the next couple of weeks. You know, so much of play calling. You know, everybody has the same plays. Everybody runs mesh. Everybody runs count, a little bit of counter. Everybody runs zone. Everybody runs your hitches. You know, your, your man beaters. They all – I mean, everybody – there's there's only so many concepts in football, right? Mm-hmm. So, really what, what play calling comes down to is timing. And I thought, you know, the, the, the deep shots, you know, the, the shots that uh, win to strike, I thought Casey Dunn was on target. You know, the one to Rashad Owens basically to end the game – that was huge timing, and that was great timing. The first one to Jaden Bray, you know, and then the one to Leon Johnson was just simply fantastic. Right when OSU had to score, Rashad Owens almost caught one. So not only did he set up the, the run with the pass, he also knew when to strike and to take advantage of that one-on-one coverage on the back end. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't say enough about how much of an improvement it has been in terms of play calling this year um, as opposed to the last few years. Um and I think a lot of it, a lot of it also has to do with you don't have a guy in in and this is not putting Alan Bowman down. You don't have a guy in Alan Bowman to kind of make you look right in turn. You, he just doesn't have the speed and the the athleticism that we've had in the past with Spencer Sanders. And I think a lot of the time there were a lot of breakdowns and a lot of just bad play calls that we. I mean, we were lucky enough to have an extremely athletic and fast quarterback that was able to, to make adjustments really, really quick with his feet. Um, that being said, I would take, I would take Alan Bowman over Spencer Sanders in terms of how the offense is run and how, you know, he, he's more of a keep your eyes downfield kind of guy. Um, Cause I, there were, I, I can count uh, probably 20 times where there's there's guys open downfield and, and Spencer doesn't get his first read so he mm-hmm. takes off with his legs um, and granted they were still probably positive plays but not big time plays when you have touchdowns I also one of my least favorite things when I was watching him play is the underthrown deep ball and I don't know if he does it on purpose to get a pass interference but it makes me so mad and it's refreshing to see a guy in Alan Bowman to put it in the bread basket just like he did to Braden uh, 
Jaden Bray. I'm sorry, Jaden yeah. Bray. Um, I, I don't think we would have had that in the past. I think he would have gotten an underthrown ball where Bray has to reach up over the rec- the, mm. the defender, maybe get to pass interference. But I, I think you've seen a lot more success with the receivers this year too, um, with having Alan Bowman at quarterback. Yeah, I think it's easier to get in a rhythm as a play caller too because you can predict more how the quarterback's going to handle the call, the play that you call. Yeah. You know, I mean, whenever you call a play and it ends up being something totally different than what you called, after about the tenth time that happens, man, it, it's just – it just throws you out of rhythm, you know. So, I mean, it's like if you're calling pitches in baseball, right, and the guy's not hitting your spots, in the, what do you do <laughs> as a pitch yeah. caller, right? Versus if a guy's hitting his spots, it's pretty easy to call pitches, right? Yeah. and No, absolutely. Um, let's not talk about pitch calling just yet, man. That, <laughs> that's what I, 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 It's one of my favorite things to do and least favorite yeah. things to do because you have to depend on one guy to execute oh, exactly yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. And if you do it wrong, you know your butt's getting chewed by the head coach. So, that <laughs> you know, it's – it's mm-hmm. frustrating, but uh, and and I also I don't want to downplay Spencer Sanders because he's he was a great quarterback here, but like I said, I'd prefer Alan Bowman's arm over Spencer the Sanders' legs. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, the defense. Hey, it's not perfect. No defense in the Big Twelve is perfect. I will say this: if there is a better linebacker than Nick Martin, I would like to see him. Yeah, that dude is just awesome. Yeah. Okay, so there was one play all day Saturday that he wasn't the spy on Donovan Smith. Mm-hmm. One play. You know what happened? They scored a touchdown. 33 yards. Yep. One play he wasn't the spy on Donovan Smith. Immediately Donovan Smith scrambled, went 33 yards, nobody could catch him. Yeah, and, okay. and he he was he is a really good quarterback. You know, he, yes. he is a good quarterback. When you give him time to throw. Yeah, absolutely. But he he's also a guy that, that – you clearly saw with the one time he didn't have a spy, he killed you with his legs, man. He's he's huge. He's athletic. He's fast. He has a he has a talented arm when he has time to throw the ball. And that's another thing is uh, Oklahoma State put a lot of good pressure on him. You know, they made him flush. They made him make bad decisions and rush rush his throws and things like that. You know, there was a there was a pick six um, that that we had that I, I don't think they were on the same page. Um, but I have no idea who he's throwing it to when he when Rucker. I, I, I tried to break that one down from an analysis, but I don't know. I don't know if that was supposed to be maybe a five yard out and he ran ten. I, I'm not sure because it, it was thrown straight to Rucker. Um, but if if you go back and I'm not mistaken, I think there was a little bit of pressure there where he's like, "Crap, I got to get rid of the ball." Um, and and that you know the, the Oklahoma State defense comes up with another timely turnover. It, yeah. it seems like they do that almost every week, um, and that's a big part of their success too. You know, you've got. Um, you've got them forcing fumbles. You got them, you know, making interceptions. Uh, special teams is playing really, really good. That's that's somebody that doesn't get talked about enough either. So the special teams for Oklahoma State has been really good, um, except for the punt deal. Uh, yeah, ran into the, <laughs> rough the punter. Oh my gosh. Uh, but I mean, you got you got a great kicker in Hale. You got, I mean, it. It's the special teams has been a lot of fun to watch this year too. Yeah. I would agree. And Coach Nardo, I think you know my feelings on him. Hey, it's not necessarily about all the production this year. It hasn't always been perfect. You know, and sometimes, or even Saturday, it just felt like, guys, are we ever going to get Houston stopped, you know? But it just seems like he solves the puzzle every week as the game goes on. Mm-hmm. By the time it's midway through the third quarter, it's like an anaconda snake. He just inch by inch by inch by inch solves the puzzle of the other team's offense. And by the by the time it, the fourth quarter rolls around, you know, OSU's getting the ball turned over. They're they're stopping the run. The the secondary, short of, of UCF, you know, I mean that that game was just a total disaster. You know, but we're talking about the six games. Other than that, in the Big Twelve Conference, even really Iowa State, they played pretty well. But it just seems like Brian Nardo just figures it out as the game goes on every single week. He does. And there's a statistic that I was that I had heard. I think it was last week that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, Oklahoma State gives up. More yards than every school in the power. It's either in the Power Five or in Division One. I think it's in. I think it's in Division One, except for like three or four. So they're in the very bottom tier of giving up yards, but they are in the top sixty in terms of de- like uh, points allowed. I mean, I don't know how that makes a whole lot of sense, but that says a lot about a defense when they're able to keep teams out of the end zone. Um, you know, that, that in itself is hard and, and they do give up big plays. And I think a lot of it has to do with their youth as opposed to 
the play calling. And a lot of the time at UCF, they were in position to make plays and they just weren't able to make. Yeah. Them. Um, you know, so I think that Nardo has, has been one of the best pickups that we've had in a mm-hmm. long time. Um, I agree. You know, I, uh, I I think very highly of that guy. Hey guys, trust me. If if you follow, if if you know me at all, if you're watching this, you know who I am. Or if you've ever followed any of my social media stuff, okay, it, I'm not always like this towards Oklahoma State, right, Chase? I mean, I <laughs> I am not. I do not hesitate to bitch and moan about OSU. Would you agree with that? I 100 percent agree. I saw many many times on your personal account last year where you are <laughs> you're ripping into them. Man, it, it's uh, uh, it's been nice to see a little bit of positivity coming out of the coming out of the uh, social media. Yeah, but so kind of what I'm saying <laughs> is, you know, from my perspective, this isn't just trying to be Pollyannish and trying to be, you know, this or that. Because if it needs to be criticized, I've never hesitated before, and I won't hesitate again. But I just, I'm just trying to beat home the point that. I am actually this impressed with the job that Coach Dunn is doing, the job that Coach Gundy is doing, and the job that Coach Nardo is doing, and the way the kids have fallen in line. It's just – this has been a lot of fun for me to watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I I think that outside of Jim Knowles, um, you know, he, he might be one of the best defensive coordinators in, in the coming years um, that Oklahoma State may ever have. You know, yeah, and, and that's 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 kind of a stretch for me to say, but I, I don't. It's going to be hard to top a Jim Knowles defense. Um, but with what Nardo has been able to do this year with the youth, um, in terms of just putting them in the right positions and then making plays with the timely turnovers and stuff like that, you know, I, I think that you're just going to see progression um, from the defense as a whole and from a defensive play calling perspective because this is his first year in Division One football. I mean, first year in Division One football, and he comes to a, a, you know, a top twenty-five team in the nation, year in and year out. That had a million conference. transfers out. I mean, yeah, Jamar Muhammad's having a great year, right? He would have yeah. been a shutdown corner. And this, it's not. That's not an easy thing to do. I mean, the transition between division was he Division Two or Division Three? I, I, it doesn't Anna, matter. Division Two. Okay. You, so, lo- yeah. you lost Bernard Bernard Converse too. I mean, mm-hmm. holy. Yeah, I, you lose all these guys, so that that's a challenge in itself. But then the speed of the game and the complexity of the game, can, as you if you go to a Division two game, um, there's plenty to go to in Oklahoma. If you go to a Division two game, and then, then you go to an Oklahoma State game, it's worlds difference. You know, in terms of speed and athleticism and all kinds of play calling, it's all a hundred times different. And he has done a great job adjusting throughout the year. Um, and, you know, and, and he came in with a very hard task. You know, he oh. lost a lot of guys. And, then it didn't start out well. No, it didn't. It didn't. Um, and just like I, it, it's kind of with the whole team. Um, he he kind of fits in with how you've seen them progress. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think the coaching staff as a whole has progressed in a major way. For if you take the the team that played Central Arkansas on September 2nd or whatever and compare them to the team that played Oklahoma we'll, we'll mark out UCF and then compare them to the team that played Houston. It, it, it's so much different of a team. I think the team that played Oklahoma and Houston would beat the team that played Central Arkansas, Arizona State, and South Alabama. I think they'd beat them by 20. And, and they I mean, beat I, Iowa State by about 10. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, that now they're – now they're dancing into the into Arlington with no issues, no worry. Um, but that being yeah. said, you got to take care of business this uh, this week against BYU, who's very capable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know if you watched the game, uh, Oklahoma and BYU in Provo. Uh, Dylan Gabriel went went down um, in the in the second half. Uh, Jackson Arnold their freshman guy is supposed to be really good. He actually wasn't bad. He he just looked like a freshman quarterback. Um, but Provo's a tough place to play, but BYU's still fighting, man. I mean, they're, they're a good football team. Um, even when Dylan Gabriel was playing, it was a close game. Um, they, it, it, I mean, it, it was back and forth with lead changes and all kinds of stuff. Um, so this is another talented team that, you know, that's trying to make a name for themselves in a Power 5 conference. So Yeah, no doubt about it. BYU's coming in at 5-6. and six. 
which is a scary team. You know why? Because they're fighting for a bowl. They yeah, win this man. week and they get a bowl game. They don't win this week and their season's over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a pretty tough position to be in. And it's a, it's a team that's going to be filled full of older, mature guys like they always have. Sataki, Kalani, I think is his first name. Sataki has been at BYU for, for quite a while. So, hey, you know that they're going to know how to prepare. They're not going to be intimidated whatsoever by Boone Pickens Stadium. So, hey, this is a game that this is – as an OSU fan, it, it, it worries me. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, rightfully so. Um, and, and BYU, if you look at their tradition and their past, they have been a good football team. You know, they, they haven't been one to really mess around with. And, you know, hopefully hopefully the, the, the shootout that they had in Provo last week against Oklahoma kind of took a little bit out of them in terms of energy and stuff like that. But that being said, Oklahoma State came down – or I mean – came back from when they were down what were, what were they down at 1.20 19 20 um so i mean i, I think it's going to be a it's going to be a battle because oklahoma state um while byu is playing for a bowl game oklahoma state's playing for a chance to play in arlington you know in the big 12 championship game so i think both teams are going to come out ready to play um it's going to be cold it's going to be wet um it, it oh is it okay I, I believe so um the the conditions aren't going to be favorable um, and what worries me about that is, is Oklahoma State really hasn't been a whole lot exposed to that because, sure, it was wet in Orlando, but it wasn't cold. Um, and BYU, I mean, that's that's kind of the norm. You know, they're up in Utah. It's cold and it's wet. Um, so they'll have a little bit more experience in terms of playing in, that, in those conditions. I, I hope they realize, and I think they will, I mean, what they have on the line. You know, it's a big deal to play in Arlington and, and to, to make it, you know, in 2021, not 2022, but then in 2023, you know, they're playing two out of three years in the Big 12 championship game. That's a big deal. Um, and it's a big deal in itself. You know, if they go in and there and they and they beat a, a, a Texas or an Oklahoma, for mm-hmm. that matter, um, you know, I, I first of all, the ranking is going to go way up and they're going to get in a better bowl game. Um, and second of all, I, I think that that just speaks volumes about your program and, and if you, especially to the recruits, because guys that are getting recruited in September and looking at where the team is at now in, in November, I, like I said, there's so much difference. And I think that if you cap that off with a big win against BYU and have a chance to win the Big 12 conference, um, you know, I think that, that speaks volumes in terms of recruiting. It's going to help you out in the transfer portal. It's going to help you out in so many different ways. And you get a chance to bring hardware back to Stillwater.